Welcome internet to a psychoanalytic talk and today I wanted to talk about a concept that I've rediscovered in recent weeks. Um, I had never forgotten it really but uh, it just sparked into my mind and I said oh yeah I would really like to talk about it. So this concept is none other than wild analysis. So what is wild analysis? Well it's First and foremost, it's a text by Freud, but I'm not going to talk about the text in of itself. What I'm going to talk about is the concept of wild analysis. So, wild analysis, very simply, refers to two sins. First and foremost, it is um, the common way of formulating it. The most common people think about it when they think wild analysis is somewhat, somewhat of a layman. Uh, for example, someone who has no training, formal training in psychoanalysis or psychotherapy and starts uh, interpreting directly on the unconscious mind. Like, for example, Freud gives the idea of a doctor that would have some kind of knowledge of psychoanalysis and would just, like, throw out um, what he thinks the patient feels. Like, brutal, non-filtered, directly unconscious material. Uh, Prototypical example is, no, you're not really afraid of spiders, you're afraid of your mother. Well, those kinds of sins are what is um, wild analysis. It's made out of a frame, out of context, just pure blasting of an interpretation onto someone. And there's a lot of violence involved, I mean, like, psychic violence in that. Because, as Freud pointed out, and even Freud knew this, it's not because you tell someone about their past, and even if it's accurate, it's not because it's accurate that the person is going to heal or going to feel better because of it. That Those things are just na naive at best and a power play at worst. And why is it a power play? Because basically it implies that the um, person doing the wild analysis has some kind of innate knowledge of the, um, of the problem. Because remember, it's not about what the, what has happened and a complex understanding of the individual. It's more like a, a spur of the moment kind of um, moment and uh, interpretation. And what's very interesting about it is that Freud says that even if it's accurate, even if, it's still wild and it's still, it worsens the condition of the patient. It's just completely something that's out of bounds. So that's the first way of seeing it. There's a layman just basically doing interpretations and with all the, basically, the pitfalls that are associated with that. But it's also, even if someone is trained in psychoanalysis and is a psychoanalyst or therapist, he still might do wild analysis. In this case, it's a little different because it's not really about um, getting things wrong per se. It might be very right, but it's about the uh, compulsion of having to interpret, having to basically give meaning to something um, abruptly, like it has to be done in a compulsive manner, like the therapist needs to put his interpretation on the phenomenon of the patient. This is something that Glover kind of talks about, how when you therapists give meaning to a dream, to a symptom, it gives you what he, what Glover um, calls a fragile omnipotence, meaning that you feel powerful, but it's always so vain and fake. And that's something that I think is very important to realize, that that common word, use of the term for, for layman is not just the single use, that even experienced psychoanalysis can at moments have moments of wild analysis and it's very important to realize them as they can hurt the patient because remember the psyche at least in the Freudian fairies and psychoanalysis as a whole is has developed with resistance with points of ignorance but unconscious ignorance meaning that the conscious mind is not aware of something only the con unconscious mind is aware of it, even then there's inner fighting within the unconscious, so it's not a simple process. And basically dams, psychic dams, have been put in place to avoid uh, overwhelmness, being overwhelmed, um, massive um, outsets of emotions, and so on and so forth. So it's something that has to be respected, both 
at a psychic level for the patient. He has to respect his own resistances. And the therapist absolutely has to respect them. That's why psychoanalysis is so long. It's because it's really respectful as a method of trying to really get to the crux of what's going on, but knowing full well that there's going to be a lot of resistance down the line. And not because the patient is ill-willed or doesn't want to put in the effort. It's just that the psyche is built upon layers and layers of resistance to certain forms of acknowledgement. And he also states Freud, and that's very interesting. It's not because someone you tell someone the core of the problem, that the core of the, the behavior just fades away. That's not the case. He does say that that's the whole point of psychoanalysis. It's to understand uh, the roots, the fundamental cause. But it's not just that. And unfortunately, there's a whole idea that psychoanalysis starts and ends with the cause of the behavior, the unconscious cause. And once you unnerve it, it's good, it's gone. In most cases, that's not how it works. It's like it goes when the person feels reassured with his inner images, imagos, and with the relationship, meaning that they feel, in a way, secure enough unconsciously and consciously to be able to let go of those symptoms. And here I'm speaking very broadly, and I'm sure there are hundreds of exceptions to what I'm saying, but I'm, I just wanted to present it so you get the main focal idea of it. And I think wild analysis is also an interesting concept when you are a therapist to keep in mind. That basically it's not because you have the knowledge, that you know every precise uh, way of interpreting, you know every single other person, and that even your interpretations can be flawed and pushed by your own will to be powerful in the situation or to be dominant in the relationship because it is there is a power dynamic, even though we try and make it as horizontal, but the patient might come in and give the therapist... Um, the idea that he's an almighty um, um, clinician, that he can guess everything, understand everything, that they have the real power. In truth, it's not the case, and it's never been the case. The clinician does not know, even with all his training, even if he's a psychiatrist, even if he's a the, um, the president of the IPA, let's say, he doesn't know. Not when you first meet. And even afterwards, he doesn't. And that's very important to keep in mind, that it's always working at two. And wild analysis is not working in tandem, it's working against. It's an individual pushing on another individual his vision of, um, of the issue, of the problem, of the root cause. And that's something that is always useful to keep in mind, that it can happen. And I wanted to also talk about how... I try and um, avoid uh, wild analysis when I do psychotherapy because I think it might help. Um, I always try and present it and frame it as an interpretation. Like, I'm not sure of what I'm saying. It's not the truth. It's not like I know. It's more like I think that might be linked to that. And I always try and see if for the patient that resonates, if for them it has at hold some water, if they feel a connection, even as minute as it can be. And sometimes they don't, which is completely fine, I then drop the idea and move on. But sometimes they say, yes, but I don't quite like connect it, but there's something there. And that's why it becomes interesting, because it shows that even though there's a, there might be a resistance, which is completely normal, there's something. There's something that we have to keep in mind, both the patient and myself in order to try and go to the fullest extent. But it's not about me projecting something onto them. It's about us working together in order to find meaning or to find the best possible way for them to deal with whatever is in their unconscious mind. And that's something I wanted to, to share because I feel that that method, so to speak, or that gimmick, if we were to use Rolo method language, it's kind of useful, I think, because it gives agency to the patient. And if he really doesn't like what you're presenting, he can reject it. And I think that's a very good me therapeutic method to always give it agency, even in your interpretations with the patient. And also, I wanted to touch and end this video also on the idea of analysis on fictional characters, because it's 
very fashionable and I like it a lot. And in those cases, I think that there is no such thing as wild analysis, right? Because you're not dealing with a real human when you're doing a fictional character. I'm not talking about a historical character necessarily, but really a fictional one, like let's say, oh, any, any whom, Luke Skywalker, Star Wars, Aaron Yeager on Attack on Titan, and infinitely more, right? Infinitely. Well, there's nothing wrong. You just do what you want because you're not going to hurt anyone by doing so. It's not about resistance here. It's about trying to find something that's interesting to say or having your vision of a clinician or someone interested in psychoanalysis onto um, a fictional character. So it can even be good practice, I think, and uh, a good way of like getting the gears uh, warm for for. for for professional work, or even as a just as a hypothesis and getting yourself thinking. So that's very good. There's no such thing as wild analysis when we're talking about fictional characters, right? This is really fundamentally when you're with patients, when you're when you are with real people, right? That's you have to keep it in mind that you can't interpret brutally on the unconscious, and not like that, not in not. Brutally, you have to take into the transference and the resistance into account. So I hope you found the video interesting, and if you have any questions or any comments, please feel free to let them let me know. So I'll see you in the next one. Bye.